It's our Savior. Amen. If you want to open your Bibles, uh, we'll be in uh, John 2. And today we're actually wrapping up our series, Jesus the True and Better. Uh, We've been in this for uh, about 12 weeks now, uh, maybe a couple weeks longer than you had hoped, nevertheless. Uh, we've been in it for 12 weeks. And for those of you who might be wondering, uh, next, next week uh, we'll begin the book of Philippians. Short, pithy, powerful book will be in Philippians. And then after that, I hope to go to the book of Acts. But we'll see how we do and we'll see what you guys all need. So that's the tentative plan. Um, We started this series, Jesus, the True and Better. Uh, It was largely prompted by some of the writing of Tim Keller in his book, Preaching, and uh, also some other biblical theologians. Um, And uh, we started this series with a little video clip uh, from uh, my buddy, Timmy. And uh, so I thought maybe we would close it out by uh, playing it again this morning. So Andrew, if you will. Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden, his garden, a much tougher garden, and whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel, who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out, not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go into the void, not knowing whither he went. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all, while God said to Abraham, Now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Now we at the foot of the cross can say to God, now we know that you love me, because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Jesus is the true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who is at the right hand of the king and forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job. He is the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. Is that a type? See, that's not typology, that's an instinct. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life, who didn't just say, if I perish, I perish, says, when I perish, I'll perish for them to save my people. Jesus is the true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so we could be brought in. He's, he's the real Passover lamb. He's, he's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible's not about you. Well, Tim, Pastor Tim Keller ends this uh, video clip with a really interesting, provocative statement. The Bible's not about you, he says. I think he's mostly true on that. If he were sitting here, I'd want to push back and have a conversation about that a little bit. I know what he means. And what he means is the Bible's not primarily about us. We're secondary characters, if you will. It means that we don't approach the Bible like Grimm's fairy tales, a book of stories, each with the moral from which we choose a couple and practice some self-help. That's not what the Bible is. The Bible is the storybook of God. The Bible is God's self-revelation. It is the way by which we know him, his reason for creation, his character, his nature, and his plan for redeeming rebels through Jesus. In other words, God is the main character. God is the protagonist of Scripture. God is the hero. He is the primary subject of the Bible. And though he is intimately connected to us, his creation... He is the central point of the scriptures. One of my friends and and a professor at Western Seminary, Ryan Lister, and I've recommended his book to you in your notes, uh, also with some others. He says this. He says, this is his autobiography, not ours. And I like that. Uh, I think that gets it right. And yet, amazingly, the God of the universe, the true and the living God, has graciously chosen to create to love, and to rescue, and to save us forever. And this is done by his grace, his grace and his mercy, not by our merit. 
Um, this hermeneutic that we are looking at here, a way of reading the Old Testament and seeing Christ in the Old Testament, this isn't just the work of Tim Keller. This is not just my idea. This isn't just the result of some other biblical theologians. This is actually something that Jesus himself prescribed to us, a way by which we should read what we've been calling the left side of our Bible, right? We're meant to read the Old Testament in such a way that we see Jesus prevealed, uh, to make up a word. I think I made up that word. If that's a real word, I wish I'd made it up. If I heard it somewhere else and used it, I'm just going to start claiming it as mine. <laughs> prevealed. Jesus is prevealed. And, and Jesus said this to some of the religious leaders who knew the word but didn't know, uh, they, knew, they knew the words of God, but they did not know the living word of God in their flesh, right? Or in the flesh, in their midst. In John 5, 39, he said, you study the scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. What a, what a warning that we could know all of the words of God and not know the God of the word. And that is what had happened to these religious leaders. Also, uh, after his resurrection, Jesus encounters a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus and has an interesting conversation with them. And uh, kind of asking why they're so upset, they tell them this story about a guy named Jesus who was killed and one whom they thought was going to come and redeem Israel. And, uh, and, and then they go on to tell them uh, of this unfortunate crucifixion, to which Jesus replies, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets uh, have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures. That's left side only. That's all there was. And all of the scriptures concerning himself. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So it is my sincere desire that this, this series would have opened your eyes and inflamed your heart to see Jesus prevealed in the left side of your Bible and to know that that is the way we are to read it. Up to this point, we've really focused on what we're calling figures or people. And now uh, we've kind of made the shift into a couple of features. Two weeks ago, looking at Jesus, the true and better Passover lamb. And today we look at Jesus, the true and the better temple. Jesus, the true and better temple. And what we're going to do is we're going to start in John chapter 2, verse 13. We're going to kind of start in the middle of the Bible's uh, content on this, and then we're going to do what's called a, a biblical theology. We're just going to trace the thread through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. But we'll start in the middle here. John 2, 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all people from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So a lot in this passage, a lot we could chase down. I really want to key in on this phrase of Jesus here, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. From a big picture standpoint, the concept of a temple, of the temple of God, has everything to do with God being present with his people, God present with created mankind. And so from this description, many theologians even see the Garden of Eden as kind of the first temple, if you will. 
uh, kind of the original temple of God, the place where God interacted with his creation, walked in the cool of the day with Adam. Uh, Even seeing the commands initially given to work the garden and to take care of it, not just as agricultural responsibility, but sort of a priestly work, uh, sort of coaxing the goodness out of creation which God has made. But as you know, sin enters the world through Adam and Eve, and they are therefore banished from the garden. Or to use Cornelius Plantinga's words, sin vandalized the shalom of God. Shalom being goodness and wholeness and peace and integration and all things as they ought to be. You know those moments in life when you think, I finished my to-do list. I don't have to be at any events tonight. There's no chores for me. I have no responsibilities. The car's not broken down. Everything is good. You know that moment that comes over you every now and then and you're like, ah. I just have this moment of peace. That's just a, just a snapshot of shalom, right? Just a snapshot. And I love Cornelius planting his word, the vandalism of that. A couple of years ago, I was out skiing. I hate to bring up cross-country skiing in a, this particular time. I don't agree with Pastor Adam. It's not fall. It's not even close. I got lots of fishing to do yet. So. But I was cross-country skiing over in some of my favorite trails over here by UAF. And it was just one of those peaceful moments. You know, it was good snow. It was freshly groomed. There was some fresh fall, uh, fresh falling snow. It was quiet. It was peaceful. It was just well lit. And it was just me. And it was like, this is glorious. I'm loving it. And I went through one of my favorite stretches through the beautiful birch trees there. And somebody had come in with spray paint and painted hearts on on the uh, trees. Sally loves Billy, whatever. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, You've vandalized my shalom, you know, like you've wrecked my experience here. This is, this is what sin has done as it's come into the world. Much worse than that, of course, much worse. But God does not write off his creation. God's story goes on. His autobiography goes on from Adam to Abel to Noah to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph and eventually to Moses. And with Moses, God rescues his people. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God graciously institutes a way by which a sinful people can approach a holy God. He rescues them from their captivity. He then gives them his law, and he gives them instructions for building the tabernacle, right? This this tent, this portable venue where God would again be with his people and dwell with them. Um, we have this little pop-up camper that is the, my base of operations when I go fly fishing to different streams in Alaska. I think I'm going to get a tire cover for the back that says Tabernacle, you know, Eric's Tabernacle, this place of refreshment where I really do get to connect with God and by being in his creation. But this Tabernacle is kind of a preview a first installment of the future temple. And with it, God will teach his people about himself. And so that's our first point. The tabernacle taught God's people about his loving presence. There's many things that we could learn and that God's people did learn from the tabernacle, but I want to focus on this one for starters. It it taught these Hebrew refugees that God wanted to be with them. And, and, and I would say, if you hear nothing else this morning, this is the point I want you to hear. This is what I want you to get and to know with all of your heart. God's heart to be with his people, with his creation. As it was in the garden, he draws near again to these Hebrew refugees, and he will do it again and again until the end of time. God did not create us for some abstract existence or for a life outside of him. He made us for himself. The triune Godhead, brimming in love one for another, wanted to share this love with the creation. God did not make us because he was lonely. He was completely satisfied in himself, but had love to share and so created that we might enjoy that and be blessed by that and enter into that. That is his Delight, that is what he wanted to do. We were made for him, to delight in him, 
We were made to live in loving community with the God of love. That's what it means to be human. That's what we were made to do. That's what it is to be made in the image of God. A lot of things get smuggled into that. You ever notice as image bearers of God, then people make up whatever they want. <laughs> but this is what it means to be image bearers of God, that we were made for, with the capacity to relate to the God of the universe. The problem, Israel, after 400 years of captivity, had lost their knowledge of God. Being in this polytheistic nation, and having all of their ideas warped again and again and again, they had lost their knowledge of God and of his love and of his desire to be with them. And so everything about the Exodus is God demonstrating his supremacy over all of these false deities of Egypt. And even in the journey from Egypt to the promised land, God is systematically teaching his people that he delights in them, that he wants to be with them, that they were made for him. It's almost like, imagine if you were to adopt a child out of an obscure and loveless situation, and you were going to bring them into your home. There are things that you would have to teach them, things that many of us take for granted, that they're unconditionally loved, that you're not going anywhere, that they belong to you, they're with you, your desire to be with them. You would have to create an understanding of these things which don't exist all by themselves. In the same way, God needed to do this for this group of Hebrew refugees. And so he gives them these two wonderful gifts. He gives them the law. This was something that they treasured. I mean, we tend to look at the law as an outmoded thing because we have Christ, praise God. But they treasured this. Some instructions on how one interacts with God and what his expectations of his people were. But the second gift is the tabernacle. This was a way that God had communicated his intent to dwell with them. And so Israel has encountered firsthand, right, the power of Almighty God. They saw the deliverance from Egypt. They saw the plagues dispensed. They saw God rip his people out of the hands of these oppressive, uh, uh, oppressive Egypt. They saw him part the Red Sea. They saw his provision in the quail and the manna and water from a rock. Uh, they saw God journey with them as a pillar and a fire. They saw the power of Almighty God, his holiness that shook the mountain when they came to the base of Sinai. And in fear, they said to Moses, you go up, right? We don't want a piece of that. There's power there. There's holiness there. Not sure we can approach that. And so Moses goes up and he brings back not just the law, but also blueprints for the tabernacle. And with the tabernacle, this sinful, rescued, yet rebellious people would learn how to safely approach a God of that power and that holiness and that might. It was a gift, it was a delight something that they loved. And so this is the first installment of the, temp, uh, of the temple, uh, the tabernacle, sort of this temporary dwelling place of God's presence. Well, as you know, God would take them from this place on into the promised land, battles and skirmishes later. Uh, David would conquer the land. They would be uh, in Jerusalem and looking outside and being a little bit insecure about his fine accoutrements and uh, his place says, maybe we should do better than the tent for God, right? And so David has in his heart to build a temple. And God says, nice heart. Let's let the little guy do it. Let's let Solomon, let's let your son be the one. This is our second point. The first temple solidified God's covenant God's commitment to his people. It made them permanent instead of more or less this temporary dwelling. Probably many of you have experienced this when you moved to Alaska as we did. Initially, people hold you at arm's length. They're a little cagey like, hey, we've met nice people before and they left quickly. We've said goodbye to a lot of people. We're not ready to let you into our lives until we know a few things. So there's some little hurdles you've got to go through, right? The first is, Make it through a winter. Make it through a winter. You get through one and you come back, we'll talk, okay? 
Another sort of rite of passage is uh, buy a home. Oh, you bought a home. All right, you're stuck here like the rest of us. Okay, maybe we'll let you into our lives. The third one, of course, is you got to kill something larger than yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah, a caribou or a bear or moose or something. And you knock out those three things and then people go, come on down, we can be friends now, right? And they kind of let you in. Uh, that comes to mind when I think about God putting down roots with the temple. What kind of security, what kind of confidence did that give? Uh, but God shows them that he's not going anywhere. He establishes his presence on earth in the temple. He institutes the sacrificial system, a pattern and a place of worship, the Ark of the Covenant there above which his presence dwelt, remnants in the Ark reminding them of the ways that God had provided for them in the past. The problem is, as the old hymn says, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love, right? And we sing that hymn and we sing that line with gusto, not because we're so proud of it, but because we know it to be true of our hearts, right? John Calvin has called the human heart an idol factory. He was right. Israel did wander. They did pursue the worship of other gods again and again and again. They were unfaithful. And as we know, God sent a corrective discipline their way in the form of captivity to Assyria and to Babylon. The temple destroyed, the city destroyed. And I think it probably is nearly lost on us the full weight and the implication of this loss. All of the reassurance that was established when the temple went up, to see it decimated is to wonder, does God want anything to do with us now? Is the whole relationship off? Are we on the outside looking in? Is it over? And so God gives uh, an incredible gift, which is Temple 2.0. The second temple taught God's people his grace and his mercy. Again, though the people of God had broken covenant, God would keep his covenant to his rebellious people. I want you to turn your Bibles, if you would, to Jeremiah, back to your left side of your Bible here, Jeremiah chapter 29. And we're going to go to one of the most misused and misappropriated verses in all the scriptures. Jeremiah 29, 11, which says so handsomely and so, in, you know, such flattering language, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. You know, this is the verse used for dads and grads, right? This cake-topping verse. What's going on here? This is the verse of encouragement that accompanies divine discipline. They're going to exile for 70 years, which is kind of a massive time out if you want to think about it that way. And in that moment, as God is sending them off, he gives them this reassurance. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Now it goes on. Let's get the meat of it. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity I will gather you from all of the nations and the places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is about more than dads and grads. This is about a God who keeps his covenant even with faithless people. And so after 70 years of exile, God moves in the heart of the foreign king Cyrus to let his people go. Under Zerubbabel, they come back and they rebuild the temple. Under Ezra, they learn the law and learn to practice the law and rightful worship. And under Nehemiah, they reestablish the wall around the perimeter of the city so they will not reassimilate into the cultural and pagan trappings around them. So I want to read this to you. This is from Ezra 3. Um, this is one of the verses in Scripture that makes me laugh, even though maybe it shouldn't. I'll preface it with that. 
When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all of the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But... Many of the older priests and the Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. I like this. This makes me laugh. I appreciate that God gave us this honesty in the scripture because as a pastor, you know, can you imagine a church of 500 or so people? We don't all want the same things. We don't all like the same things. We don't all celebrate the same things. And when I read in scripture, hey, this is nothing new. One group said, awesome. Look at the foundation of the temple, our place of worship, a sign of God's commitment to us. It's built, let's go. And the other group's going, ah, The other one was better, or something. I don't know. You can't even distinguish who's who because of the noise. I read that, and I go, thank God. We're doing okay. We're still, the church is the church, right? I do want to ask you this, though. This second temple that was built here, again, it taught God's people of his grace and his mercy. But that does not mean that one should take God lightly. God is a God of love, but he is a God who loves fiercely. He is a God who describes himself with the surprising adjective, jealous. He's jealous for you, rightfully jealous for that which is his. And so I want to ask you, is there a counterfeit love, a false love, something else in your life that has cropped up to be number one, where God alone should be. And if so, I will caution you because God will do whatever he needs to do to bring his people back to himself. I would say if you have identified an idol, a counterfeit God, something that is a good thing but that has become a supreme thing where God alone should be, I would tell you repent of it, renounce it, and take it down. You take it down. Or God will because that's his place. He's a jealous God, and he will do what he needs to do to bring you back to himself. But then we find something interesting as we move on. We see that Jesus proclaimed to be the real temple. Jesus said this. It's not immediately clear to his audience kind of how he's re- that he's referring to this or he's referring to himself. They just watch him set things to right in the temple. They've cluttered it with a marketplace, a kind of distraction from what the temple ought to have been, and Jesus sets it right. And then after doing so, they, of course, ask, oh, we're going to need a sign to see that you have the authority to do this. You got a badge, you know, you got something here to let us know. And what's fascinating to me is, once again, Jesus, when asked for a sign, tells them it's going to be the resurrection. Remember, he said this earlier when he referred to the sign of Jonah, As Jonah was in the belly of the earth three days, or the the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, belly of the fish, sorry, I can hear the correction emails coming already, (laughs) the belly of the fish, three days and three nights. So the son of man will be in the belly of the earth three days, right? And here he says again, you want a sign? You want to know that I have the authority to do this. Once again, it's going to be the resurrection. The resurrection is the the sign of Christ's authority to do anything he wishes So, but why does Jesus use this language? Why does he refer to himself as the temple? It's a little weird, isn't it? Temple. There's a lot of images I could think of relating to Christ. Why does he call himself the temple? Here's why. Because the temple is the site of God's presence on earth. And so is Jesus. Because the temple confirms God's commitment to his people. So did Jesus. Because the temple teaches us of God's holiness, his mercy, his grace, and his fierce love. And who better showed that than Jesus? 
because the temple is the way that a sinful people can approach a holy God. And so is Jesus. And because the temple is the mechanism by which sin was atoned for, and supremely this is done in Jesus. Because Jesus will perform in his bodily death and in his resurrection all of the beautiful functions of the temple. Jesus is the true and the greater temple, the true and better temple. This is not the only place we find this reference, but also in uh, John 1, if you'll go back to the New Testament, first chapter of John's gospel uh, in 114. Now, I'll give you some warning here. We're going to get really geeky, or I am, and you'll mock me, and that's okay. We're going to do a little geeky Greek here. John 1.14, probably a familiar verse to you, says that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This phrase here, that he made his dwelling among us, is very interesting in the original Greek. The word dwelt or made his dwelling, depending on your translation, is actually echinosin. And the base of that word, the root of it is skene, which means tent, or to set up a tent, to encamp. And so some tra translators will even render the word tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. What God was setting up in Eden and the tabernacle and the first temple and the second temple, Jesus shows to be a continuation of this God dwelling with his people. And then the apostles Peter and Paul continue on with this theme, shockingly calling you and me the temple of God. In uh, Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That is the stunning thing. We, we don't go to church. We are the church. We don't go to a temple. God is making us into a temple as he inhabits us by his Spirit. Tozer goes as far as to call us portable sanctuaries. I like that one. He says this, everything in all creation is to point to the creator and evoke within an ordering one, adoring wonder and admiration and worship. Wherever we go, we can worship. Jesus taught essentially that we are portable sanctuaries. And if we are worshiping in spirit and in truth, we can take our sanctuary around with us. God is making us into his temple. And then finally, we look forward to a future and fuller temple. Jesus glorified with us fully. Fully. When we turn to the book of Revelation, we find a description of uh, the new Jerusalem, the city coming down out of heaven. Once again, once again, God coming to mankind. I hope you see that consistent theme. But we're told something really shocking about this city. There's no temple, sort of. And I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of the Lord gives it light and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Amen to that, said Alaskans. <laughs> they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, for anyone, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Friends, what we have just done is a biblical theology chasing the motif of this temple. And the point that you should come away with this morning, and I hope it's loud and clear for you, is this, that God really wants to be with you. That has been his consistent move throughout all of mankind's shenanigans throughout history. God continues to move towards you 
And this temple motif is the way that he has shown that. Jesus is the true and the better temple. Let's pray. Father, if we rightly think of you and your holiness and your glory and your might, and we think rightly of our sinful nature and our wandering heart, it's hard, it would be hard to believe that you would ever want to be with us. And yet we thank you, Lord, for the storyline of Scripture, your autobiography, of all of the ways that you show us that you have made us and made us for yourself. You consistently incline your heart to us, and this temple motif is a way that you show it. We see that Jesus is the true and the better temple. So thank you for what you're making in us, and thank you that one day we will be with you and in the presence of the Lamb, the true temple. We praise you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.